the stars glimmer and shine, all asleep on a lonely farm deep in the hour of midnight. The moon travels its silent path. The snow shines white upon the pines. The snow shines white upon our roofs. Only the Christmas tomped awakes from the woods. Quiet lie the woods and the whole country round. All life is slumbering. From, a pa from afar the stream sounds a hushed rushing. The tomta listens and half dreaming thinks that he hears time streaming. Wonders whither it shall go. Wonders where the fountains may flow. Over 100 years ago, the Swedish writer Victor Ryberg wrote this poem about the Tomta in midwinter. His poem is still famous in Sweden today. A Tomta is something like an elf from Scandinavian folklore. The Tomta or Nissa takes care of a farmer's home and children. The Tomta protects them from misfortune, especially at night when they are asleep. A Tomta is short and wears a red cap. And perhaps we will see the Tomta this winter day.
December 13th is the day that Swedes and others all over the world honor the legend of St. Lucia. For many, many years, Lucia has brought faith, hope, and a reason to believe in good things to come. Her legend comes from Syracuse on the island of Sicily. It is thought that during a time when the rulers of the land did not look favorably upon Christianity, a woman named Lucia had devoted her life to God and the poor. She gave her entire dowry to the poor, and the man she was to marry was very upset by this. Lucia was put on trial, refused to renounce her Christian belief, and was put to death. There are many theories on how the legend of Lucia came to Sweden. It could have been brought by priests, German traders, or even by the Vikings and their adventures to Southern Europe. No one knows just how it evolved into the Swedish tradition it is today, and there are many versions of a Swedish Santa Lucia story. Whatever the facts to the legends surrounding Lucia, the truth is that her courage to stand up and be counted a Christian in spite of torture and death is the light that may lead us all on our own journey throughout life. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, the 11th chapter. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar, but on the lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But it, if it is not healthy, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, consider whether the light in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, with no part of it in darkness, it will be as full of light as when a lamp gives you light with its rays.
You know, I have to admit, sometimes after reading the gospel lesson, and I say, or now chant as it were, this is the gospel of the Lord, I sometimes think, really? This is the gospel? This is good news? And this doesn't sound like good news. The beginning, it sounds more like condemnation. When John starts saying, I mean, it's not really good news when someone starts saying, instead of like, hi, how are you? They're like, you brood of vipers. It's kind of downhill from there, I think. And he tells people to watch out and to not take their lineage for granted. This is what the people who put together our three-year cycle of readings decided we needed to hear on this Gaudete, this Rejoice Sunday. I mean, John's initial message seems better suited for the wake-up call of Advent 1 than for today. But then after the condemnation comes what we Lutherans might be tempted to call works righteousness. Because when people, scared out of their wits, ask what shall we do, John gives them a list of things to do. And then our gospel lesson ends by saying, so with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Really? There's a segment, uh, the end of November, that ran on the, on the Today Show. The Today, Today Show surveyed parents and asked, what are the characteristics that we would love to kind of raise our children? What do we want to teach our children? What's most important? And the top three were honesty, kindness, and a strong work ethic. Combined, 83% of the people that did the survey said one of those three things. And what strikes me about this and why I bring it up today is that it seems to be exactly what John is telling the crowd to do and how he's telling the crowd to act. He tells the tax collectors to be honest. Collect no more than the amount prescribed to you. And he tells the crowd to be kind. Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. And he tells the soldiers, who are basically hired mercenaries, to work hard. Do not exhort money from anyone by threats and false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. And I think while we might want to interpret this as works righteousness, this actually might be the good news we are supposed to hear today. So I, may, I may be the only one, but how many people have ever wondered what God expected or what God wanted them to do in a specific situation or more generally in life? Has anyone kind of asked that question? Like I said, I may be the only one. Before I leave here, I'm going to get people raising their hands. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even though I think it's less out of um, fear of condemnation and more just out of a general desire to please God, we tend to ask that question every now and again in maybe different, different ways. The only strange thing about how John answers this is honestly how boring the response is. After hearing what John says, we almost want to say, really? I mean, is that all God wants? That's pretty much what we learned in kindergarten. We just need to be kind and honest and, and work hard. I mean, it seems too mundane. It seems too easy. It seems not even worth a sermon. But I hope you guys will indulge me for a little bit. Because as much as mundane as it seems, John seems to think that yes, that's all. I mean, we're in the season of Advent. And I might say Advent is more about preparing for Jesus' second coming than it is about his first. So, but when, so when we're living in expectation of Christ's return, I want to say that everything looks different. Remember when I said last week that God acts in usually the, through the areas that we often overlook in our lives, through the simple and, and, and easy 
yet very significant acts. So I want to say in expectation of Christ coming back, the simple acts of sharing what we have, being honest and working hard, and I would say resisting the urge to be bullies, can actually have cosmic significance. They're no longer empty platitudes in light of the coming kingdom of God. What John is saying, in light of the kingdom of God, we can, the way we act, announces the kingdom, announces the reality that we hope for, and the reality that Jesus will usher in when he comes. So on this Gaudete Sunday, we can rejoice in the fact that we can be part of God's future kingdom today. Now let me be straight. We do not and cannot bring about God's kingdom. We can't speed up its arrival. Nothing we do will affect that. Only God knows and can affect that. But this is not works righteousness either. It's as Peter says, witnessing to the hope that we have within us. And John is saying that we can witness to God's coming reality by living like it's already here. We can witness through our lives and actions that which we hope for. We can live as if, the, if we really believe that God's future will arrive at any moment. And as if that future kingdom really is good news for the world today. We can, through our simple acts, become, if you will, ordinary saints. We can shine the light of Christ into our world which struggles against darkness. Imagine is if each of us, through our acts, metaphorically had the lights on our head. I say metaphorically because I would not want to do what she did. <laughs> into the world. Remember John, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. For those theology nerds, and I don't know if we have any with us, what I'm speaking of is proleptic living. Living as if the future is real today. And if it still seems too mundane, just keep in mind where we are today. Not two weeks out from Christmas, but in a world that seems increasingly fearful and violent and overcome with darkness. What might happen if we strove to redouble our efforts to be honest and kind and hardworking, to meet the needs of those around us, to reach out and welcome the stranger and the outcast, and to help those who struggle. What would happen if we strove even more to live, as Paul says in Romans 12, to outdo one another in showing honor? Or as Micah says, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Instead of pounding our fists in anger, we extend a hand in welcome. In the everyday, in the mundane, in the world, we live in. Because in all these ways, we witness to our confidence in God's desire to make a feast for all nations, to remove the shroud of death that is cast over all peoples, and to wipe away all disgrace and all tears from all faces. And if enough people through seemingly mundane and ordinary acts, lived like ordinary saints. Just think of what this world might look like. Yesterday, I uh, took Ella and Landon out to run some errands. And we ran some errands, we had lunch, and then we came home. And when we got home, Ella's like, and my six, she's six, she's like, we need a family meeting. Literally, first thing she stepped in the door, we need a family meeting. And what struck me is we don't have family meetings. So I don't know where she got this from. I mean, we talk about important stuff as a family, but we don't have, we don't call it that. She says, we need a family meeting. So we all sat down to listen to what she has to say. 
And she said, okay. So on the drive back from the store, I saw too much trash. Mommy and Daddy, we need to clean up this world. And of course, we're kind of shocked at the honesty and, and, uh, and I think the magnitude and naivete of her statement. It really hit us. And so while we're trying to kind of figure out what to say, I took a deep breath and I said, you know, Ella, you're right. We do. But let's start with our neighborhood. Let's try to clean up the area we live, not all of Washington, D.C., or the world. I know this all sounds like small potatoes. I know it sounds like, really, we just got to be nice to people? It's just so easy. And sometimes, the wor you know, especially in this world, it seems to be falling apart. But I think that's part of John's message and Jesus' witness, that precisely because we have faith, that God has promised to redeem all flesh in due time. We are free here and now to tend to our little corner of the world, trusting that even the seemingly smallest gestures do make a world of difference. Amen. People of this the time is near of the crowning of the year. Make your house fair as you are able. Train and come on and set the table. People of this the time is near of the crowning of the year. Make your house fair as you are able. Oh,